I am your host, Christopher Calloway, and this is Creator Talks, the show where I interview writers and artists working in comic books and in other mediums. You may have heard of the animated series Axe Cop, which ran for two seasons on Fox and FXX. My guest today is Ethan Nicole, who conceived of the character Axe Cop while playing with its co-creator and Ethan's little brother, Malachi. I discuss with Ethan how Axe Cop went viral on the internet and led to its Dark Horse comic book and animated television series. What is the connection between Axe Cop and Ethan's first webcomic, Bearmageddon? And how did Blake Snyder's Save the Cat, Nathan's own analysis of films, including Shaun of the Dead, help him to refine the story structure of Bearmageddon? Ethan is currently illustrating Appalachian Apocalypse, written by she creator Billy Tucci and published through Cave Pictures. Billy was not available to be on the show with Ethan today to discuss Appalachian Apocalypse. But during the Kicking Back with the Creator segment, Ethan takes his best guess what Billy does for a rest and relaxation, his favorite birthday, what posters were in his room during middle school, his island book, beverage of choice, and action figure accessory. We also find out Ethan's answers to these questions, plus the oddest job he ever had, and in his humble opinion, the best film ever made. This interview is brought to you by The Comic Book Shop at 1855 Marsh Road in Wilmington, Delaware at the Plaza 3 Shopping Center, where comics are for everyone. Just be nice. And so please join me and writer-artist Ethan Nicole, here now on Creator Talks. Thank you for joining me from the West Coast. Thanks for having me. I'm glad we could get together at a time that's not too early for you because I'm out here on the East Coast. Your rest is important to be productive. (laughs) Now, you have a little one, what, about a year and a half now? Yep, my youngest. So you have two? Actually, I have four. I have two stepkids and two regular traditional kids, but I got to raise all four of them, so I count them all. (laughs) How are you holding up? How do you do it? What are the age ranges? I ask myself that every day. I'm like, how did I... Because I went from being a total bachelor, like art guy, just sitting there drawing 24 hours a day and flying by the seat of my pants financially has been the story of my life. Whatever art gig I can get, I do and trying to, I'm always trying to create my own stuff. I married into two kids, Instaparent, and then a couple years ago I had my daughter and then now I have my son. So now I have, um, spread is 12, nine, four, and one and a half. So you hesitate like me. <laughs> I know, because it changes so fast. I've been calling the nine-year-old eight for like three years now. You know, as I often say on the show, people know, I always get my daughter's age wrong, but she'll be 25 this year, so that's a good, easy one for me to remember, because I have a big spread too. Previous marriage, the 25-year-old, and then I have a two and a seven-year-old. The nice thing is, I have some prior parenting experience to bring into it, so I had some idea what to expect. Mm-hmm. I'm sure for you, having broken in with you know the step parenthood, that kind of helped get you ready in, in some mm-hmm. sense. In some sense, no one can ever be really ready. There are no instructions. It's interesting because there's things you miss out on too when you're a couple who gets married and you already have kids. But uh, I can see how having kids could be a real shock to a marriage. And we, from the beginning, it's been an aspect of everything. So I think it's helped in that aspect anyway. What you do for fun and to have time together changes once you have yeah. kids, you know, cause like last night I had posted this on Twitter <laughs> that I said, it's a romantic evening at the home and, or my home, not the home. Although the way I feel sometimes mm-hmm. it's like the home. I had uh, <laughs> the Punisher on TV on Netflix with a bottle of wine and some candles. That was our romantic evening was the kids are asleep. <laughs> yep, exactly. That's why I stay up till 3 a.m. Oh, you stay up till three? Actually, generally lately more like one or two now, but some nights three. Is that to get work done or is that just so you have some no, time yourself? No, that's to decompress. I used to work at night. I can't work at night anymore. My brain's so fried by the time I get everybody in bed and the dog's fed and everything's done. It's like nine o'clock, wife's asleep, and I'm like I'm ready to just Netflix and just sit there. I understand. Well, we'll get to some of the stuff you do for fun down the road here, but... Something I want to talk to you about is this web comment that you created, Bear Mageddon. Great name and a great idea. <laughs> yeah. What did you experience or read that gave birth to that web comic? And specifically, how did Blake Snyder's Save the Cat and the movie Shaun of the Dead help your idea take shape? 
I've always been a huge fan of horror comedy, and I feel like it's a... I mean, there are a lot of horror comedies, but there's not very many good ones. Shaun of the Dead is one of the few good ones, I think. Really funny and not just depending on gore. I do love me some gore, but like I really like that as a genre. Um, the whole idea goes back to... I used to be in a rock band, and my co-frontman of the rock band, he was a landscaper at the time while I was a graphic designer... And he'd go out and landscape, but he'd just be thinking of stuff all day. And then whenever he'd get off, we lived together. So he'd come home and he'd just start like going off on whatever he'd been thinking about or joking about. And he'd think about bears a lot. And so he started coming up with all these scenarios. Like, what if there was a town out in the middle of nowhere and bears just destroyed it and killed everybody? So so the government had to like blow it up and wipe it off the face of the earth and cover it up because they didn't want humanity to know that the bears could do that or they're, they're capable of it because you know we go to a panic all these weird things like that and uh and we had this other joke about a guy named dickinson kilder because we were on a very poor penniless tour through kind of the west side of the midwest and uh we were out in north or south dakota i can't remember which one and there was a sign for a place called Dickinson and a place called Kildare. And we kept joking about how there's like this Davy Crockett character named Dickinson Kildare who runs around the forest. He's kind of like a psychopathic Gary Busey version of Davy Crockett or something and defends raccoons from cougars or something. Or he's trying to bring justice to the forest. So he's kind of a joke and we'd sing stupid songs of these long road trips. He became a character that I wanted to do a comic of, and I combined with this bear comic idea that I had where he fights bears. And, and I had written, like, probably four or five different, complete different iterations. I did, like, a 1984 dystopian version of Bear Bearmageddon, and I wrote one about a father and a son out on a Boy Scout trip. I was so frustrated. I had moved to L.A. I was in Hollywood. I had been reading Save the Cat. I've been really trying to get a hang on story structure. And if, for people who don't know, Save the Cat is... A great screenwriting book. It's very simple. It's for people like me that can't process really smart writing like the other screenwriting books that are out there. So this one makes it really simple. And So I found out on a website that Blake Snyder, the author of Save the Cat, had these seminars, or not seminars, like a little workshop where he limited the group to 12 people and you were with them for a whole weekend, multiple days, and they'd help you crack your story. And so I decided to spend the 800 bucks or so or 1200 or whatever it was. And I had hardly anything at the time when and did it. I narrowed it down and he helped me kind of crank out this story that was Shaun of the Dead with Bears. Which, When I told him what I really wanted the story to be, that's what, he just, that's what he said back to me. He goes, oh, it's Shaun of the Dead with Bears. That's the connection to Save the Cat. It's a full story I've been slowly cranking out over, shoot, almost... I don't know, almost 10 years now, I think. <laughs> Crazy. It's always been kind of my passion project. So I want the art to be high quality and I just I want to be proud of every page, you know. So as far as Save the Cat, being a visual artist, maybe that spoke to you better. It was easy to comprehend because not everybody learns the same way. I think a lot of screenwriting and, and people who want to write books about story in general, they are excited because it's like a science and they're excited to write this book so that they can wax philosophical and go down rabbit trails and show how there's like almost like these crazy math equations that make everything work but it's just very deep and confusing what save the cat did for me is it gave me a clear clean humble outline of what story beats a story needs and it helped me that now that i read those other books i understand them better before it was like reading a foreign language so it's really a good introductory book on writing for somebody who uh, i don't know if it's that i'm not intellectual or if it's, it was a language i didn't get like i was just they're losing me and he just stays on topic on save the cat he keeps his teaching is simple you also studied Shaun of the dead to help get the story all together there's a number of movies i studied what i would do is i'd sit there and watch the movie and every time the scene ended i'd I'd make a note about what happened in that scene. Like, what was the point of it? And why did this movie need it? So Shaun of the Dead, I did that with. I did it with Jurassic Park. I did it with Steven Spielberg's War of the Worlds. Because I really liked how the action built in that. I didn't particularly like the ending, but most people don't. But the way the action built, I really liked. So I really wanted to kind of look at what he did there. And uh, so that was one of the things. I still do. I do that a lot. If there's a, a genre I'm working on, I will think of movies I like. And I will sit there and I will just basically create a big spreadsheet and write for each. I'll make a bunch of boxes and each box will be a scene and what happened in that scene. And then for practice, I'll take my story and I'll try to write my beats 
if my story fit the exact beats of that story, what would it look like? And I never do that and make the copy and, and write it because it doesn't always work, but it gets you down thinking different ways about your story. And you did that as a webcomic, and then you had a Kickstarter to put it into print. The book that I put out was not Bear-Mageddon. Bear-Mageddon's a webcomic, and one of the things I did to try to market my webcomic was I created these bear memes because I realized you can get people to read webcomic pages and share them. It's really hard to get people to share that, an ongoing story. It's not very meme and not very, like, shareable. So I started making these bear memes about survival in Bear-Mageddon and bear attacks and the basic message that all the people will die eventually from bears. So it's kind of like mock propaganda from a world of Bermageddon. And a lot of those did go viral. Like they'd go to the front page of Reddit and crazy views. And a lot of them have been like stolen and my logo taken off and shared millions more times. But uh, I was going to do my first Kickstarter and I decided to do a book of those because I ended up turning that into a website called Bermageddon News Network that was purely... It's like the onion, but bear news. And it's just a side thing I did. I could do it well and crank it out. So yeah, anyway, I did a full book, Kickstarter. Yeah, I got over 500 backers. And yeah, the books are going to be ready in February. And then once they're out, I'll eventually release them to everybody, you know, like on Amazon and stuff, the paperback. So yeah, but it turned out really cool. It's like almost a 300-page book. It's like a fake textbook on bear survival. Like it looks like a nonfiction book. Like it's not a comic. It's lots of graphics and stuff, but it's, it's pretty ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever think the webcomic will be a book? I really want it to be a book. I think um, I wanted my first Kickstarter to be something that I wasn't emo super emotionally invested in. I didn't care much if this book didn't get made. My Bears Want to Kill You book. Um, I really liked it, but it was like, you know, I could take or leave it because it's not my passion project. It's just jokes. And I found that that has been good for me in life to like embrace projects that come easily to me that I, and I'm not particularly overly invested in emotionally. Like, I think they can get hung up. So that's what I did. For my maiden Kickstarter, I wanted to do something that if it failed, it wouldn't ruin me and make me never want to try again, you know? So I do want to eventually do the Bear Mageddon Kickstarter. I don't know when or what that'll look like. I think one of my hopes is if this book does well enough, that'll give me some money to, um, to have in the back of my pocket when I try to do a Bear Mageddon Kickstarter so that you know, I have some security there if it doesn't fund or whatever. Kickstarters are frightening. You just don't know what's going to happen. You have the backers from the last one. you got a good foundation. It's interesting. What happened with the bear memes and that audience, it really changed and built my audience. But it also, like, there's a huge amount of audience that could care less about the comic. They just like the jokes. But, so yeah, it's almost a different audience. There's, there's some crossover, but it really kind of expanded my audience to outside the comic world. Like, there's a lot of hunting websites and military people and geek websites that share my bear memes. <laughs> well, before we move away from Bear Mageddon, have you ever encountered a bear? No, I mean, I've seen I've seen a couple bears in the distance in the wild. I had like a bear cub running out in front of my car. I'm from Oregon. The closest encounter I ever had with any kind of wild animal like that was the same weekend I got my first publishing deal. I was driving home in Oregon on this small little state highway, windy state highway in the forest, and... I came around a corner and there were two mountain lions sitting in the middle of the street and one jumped out of the way and the other one jumped right in front of my car and I pegged it with my car. And I felt like this was like maybe like a symbol. I took out the king of the forest on the same weekend that I got my first publishing deal. I don't know. <laughs> so it felt like it was weird because the weird thing was the next time when I got my first TV show deal, uh, like an option from Cartoon Network. I happened to have to drive that exact same highway that day. It's like a two-hour drive, and I was scared that I was going to hit a bear or something. I have encountered a bear or two in the Appalachians, actually. And, oh, uh, wow. It's a little unnerving. I mean, yeah, I bet. The, well, the ones up there, for the most part, they're pretty mellow. They just kind of look at you and walk away. If you see baby cubs, which I did, I stayed far, far away because you yeah. do not want to get between the mother and her cubs. But yeah, it's a little, uh, as I've said on the podcast before, when I've talked about the story, the bear saw me first, which really unnerved me. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> but they, most yeah. of them just look for food. I mean, they hang around in the campgrounds, but they're used to people. You just stay clear and let them do their thing and everything's cool. I'd probably void my bowels upon seeing <laughs> that. I know I deserved it. I'm like, all right, well, <laughs> all my jokes, they all come home to roost. Here we go. <laughs> Eat me. Now, one of your most famous works is the series Axe Cop. You created with your younger brother, Malachi. And mm -hmm. I thought the story behind the story 
was really cool. Not only did it lead to a Dark Horse miniseries, but also a Fox TV series, which is amazing. And yeah, bizarre. It all started with Malachi running around saying he was an axe cop. He kept asking me to play axe cop with him. And <laughs> what he meant by that was let's play cops. Like, let's go. It's, and, and what he meant by let's play cops was let's just be general good guys who fight general bad guys. He'd just gone to a fire department. Uh, you know, they have those get togethers for the neighborhood to go and try out the siren and eat some pancakes or whatever and get a little badge. So he got a little toy fireman kit with a toy axe and a hat and stuff. So he had that toy axe. He didn't have a gun or anything that a normal cop would have. So he kept saying, will you play axe cop with me? He's just thinking that if a cop picked up an axe, he'd be an axe cop. And so it was all kind of out of his logic. And that's what makes axe cop so great because it's really the axe cop, the character, has Malachi's logic. He's very firm in it, even though he really doesn't understand how the world works yet. But he's got a very black and white idea of morality. He always tells everybody how everything is. <laughs> and he has a logic. There's a real that's that's what I love about it. People will call it random and stuff like that. And there's a randomness to it, but there's a logic to it too. And I, that's that's something I always loved about it. So yeah, we played Axe Cop finally after about the third or fourth time he had asked me. And he gave me a toy flute so that I could be flute cop. It amazes me the things that spring from kids' mouths because they don't really have these boundaries and we tend to lose that as adults, yeah. except for creative people like yourself. You know, you kind of keep your childlike wonder and enthusiasm. Yeah, working on Axcop made me really want to get out of that rut of trying to create something that fit a genre or fit what expectations. You know, what Malachi did when we made Flute Cop, he just pulled the next toy out of his toy box. It happened to be a plastic recorder. And, you know, and I just said, what's that, a flute? And we create a Flute Cop. And then most of Axe Cop was created in that way. It was just like, whatever's next. Like, oh, we're sitting at the kitchen table. There's an avocado sitting here. So now Flute Cop has turned into Avocado Soldier. It's playtime and having fun turned into a comic. And what it kind of woke me up to was that that's what comics are like it's kind of vicarious playtime with a huge budget if you're watching a movie that's what it is like you want to escape and you want to have fun what's awesome let's explore what's really awesome right now some creators would kill for that kind of exposure that you had with axe cop and how did you manage to get from concept to publish comic through dark horse to a tv series on fox many ideas just kind of languish in development like yeah we're going to do a deal and then things just yeah. how did you manage to get your pitch to the top of the pile like having connections and cultivating those relationships help? Not really. That's the crazy one, Axe Cop. I and mean, I had been in Hollywood for a couple of years. I was kind of lost and floundering. And I had two jobs. But they, neither of them were Hollywood jobs. They were just paying the bills. I was doing some storybook art for Disney. And I was doing some other flash animation for these like math problems for school. And they were very monotonous and tedious and horrifying. I was actually making good money for a few months there when I had the two jobs, and they both fired me in the same week. Or not fired me, but just let me go, laid me off. And I was, so I was without money when, when we launched Axe Cop. And we launched it. The whole reason I launched Axe Cop, I had made the comics purely for fun. I had gone that Christmas home, and I had been working on Barmageddon like crazy, almost too hard. And so I decided I was going to take a break and not think about it for the time that I was back visiting my family. And then when I got home on the 1st of January, this was advice from my friend Doug Tenaple, the creator of Earthworm Jim. He's always he's been kind of a mentor and a good friend of mine in the comic industry. We used to meet you know, multiple times a week on his back patio, smoke cigars, and talk about what we're working on. And that's what he told me on that. He's like, you've been working on your concept art and your script over and over again. And like, this just set it January 1st, start drawing Barmageddon. So that's like, that's what I'm gonna do. But on that Christmas break, even though I promised myself I was taking a break, I got so excited about these Axe Cop jokes that I decided to draw them sloppily and just for me, just have fun and make it like a sketchbook thing and just goof off. So I posted them on Facebook for my friends, and that was kind of the end of it. But then when I started drawing Barmageddon on January 1st, I got about 30 pages drawn and decided I was ready. Once I got about 30 pages, I wanted to launch the website. But then one thing I started to think was, you know, I've never done a webcomic. I don't read webcomics we should do a test run webcomic and test the functionality of the website. So my buddy who I created a website with, I go, can we do a quick rough draft website with these comics I made with my brother? We'll throw those up there. My friends and family can look at it and tell us how it functions. And maybe we should, you know, do it more like this. Or we tried this weird flash viewer on it and stuff. And so that was Axcop. It was a test run that I thought was for friends and family for Barmageddon. 
eventually Birmingham would launch and I'd have worked all the kinks out. That was the idea. So Axe got launched and it was a couple days later, something hit. I was Eisner nominated. I had a small web, uh, a small comic I had published through SLG comic or SLG graphics called Chumble Spuzz. It had gotten an Eisner nomination, but nobody read it. Like it got great reviews, but very few people read it. But I had a small audience and I had a small audience from my, the rock band I was in that kind of followed us. We were pretty popular in our area in Oregon and stuff. And it was just enough people to kind of spark going viral, which I just didn't see it coming at all. But I had you know, the tagline written by a five-year-old and illustrated by his 29-year-old brother in the title Axe Cop. That was a pitch that I had not even considered a pitch. And basically what happened was me and Doug were watching the State of the Union address one night. And by the next morning, my Twitter was going insane that night. And by the next morning, it was website of the day on Entertainment Weekly. And I was getting all these calls and emails. And talent agencies were calling me. And it was just suddenly it was insane. We were in Wired. We were on NPR. Like news companies were calling us up to do interviews. Like we were the viral flavor of the week. <laughs> you couldn't try to make that happen. No, I had so many interviews and they'd have me go speak at colleges, you know, about how do you do it? And I'm like, I have no idea. Like I didn't go to college and now I'm talking to people at college and I have no idea how I did it. So I feel like thanks for the free hotel room. <laughs> I guess your timing was just right because it might be harder today. For sure. Facebook changed their algorithms and stuff quite a bit. Though I do still have stuff, you know, like my bear memes. Every once in a while, something will go and spread like wildfire. You just you never know what it's going to be. It is definitely much more challenging now. Now, I understand you don't have anything planned in the near future with Axe Cop. Is little brother Malachi planning on continuing to create and someday strike out on his own? What's his ambition? He's never shown real interest in being a writer. And that's kind of was the interesting thing about Axe Cop. Is that he just liked playing with his big brother. And Axe Cop had created this situation where because i'm 24 years older than him where you know usually you play with your big brother who's that much older than you for a short periods of time when he visits on christmas like and that's about it but axe cop created this scenario where like we played together for like full months at a time like i'd go out there and i'd rent a little apartment like when we wrote bad guy earth our second book i was out there for an entire month and we played every day all day we bought all these dollar store toys and we built little cities out of cardboard and just whenever we get to a scene, I'd try to create like a scenario that would give me the best material. And then I'd take tons of notes and I'd figure out all the questions and plot holes I need to fill in and work that out for the next day. So we had some pretty crazy times and it was just us going nuts and me turning into a story. <laughs> Effortless effort, man. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was the interesting thing about it is that like, it's not so much that Malachi is sitting there just telling me the story. It's we're playing and playing and I'm asking all these questions and I'm forming a story. And it was kind of interesting because I was using the Save the Cat beats and like trying to plot out like, whoa, all right. <laughs> What's the dark night of the soul here? Now, something you are working on and is coming out actually is Appalachian Apocalypse with Billy Tucci. How's the feedback been so far? What have you heard in response to the book? I've gotten a lot of compliments on the art. It's a little different for traditional comics it's cartoony and yet one thing i like to do i do it in bear mageddon my my human characters are very cartoony and angular but the bears are very realistic which is kind of horrifying to see a realistic monster killing a cartoon character to me it feels like that moment the shoe is put in the dip in roger rabbit when you see a cartoon character being killed by something real the zombies they're not completely realistic but they have more detail and and so it's just a weird juxtaposition which i kind of like visually these zombies that are very dirty and gritty and they have lots of sinewy jaws are all jagged and they're killing these cartoon characters that look like they could be on a Saturday morning cartoon. I think uh, it's a lot of fun <laughs> drawing zombies. You know, I get to draw these spreads and kind of afforded me the opportunity to do a lot of zombie drawing. He also gave me a lot of challenges because you know, Billy Tucci wrote it. So I was just following a script, which is not normal for me. I pretty much usually write my own stuff. So I get to one page and it'd be like, it's a mountainside and there's thousands of monster trucks and people running up in Civil War gear and horses and zombies running down. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm just crying. Like, how am I going to draw that? <laughs> <laughs> Bailey is a powerhouse writer and he's a powerhouse <laughs> storyteller. Just talking to him, he tells great stories. Mm -hmm. Have you ever had a chance to meet him in person? We once had dinner uh, with a few other people. I met him way before this. And he's a super nice guy, super talkative. Dude's got a lot of personality. I was very quiet and shy when we met. I was with him and Doug Tenaple, and Doug Tenaple, if you've ever talked to him, is also very outgoing, outspoken, uh, loud. So the two of them were almost kind of just talking over each other. <laughs> and me and a couple other people were just taking it in. 
<laughs> the third member of this creative team is Ben Gilbert. Who is Ben Gilbert? Ben Gilbert came over from uh, Bear Mageddon, actually. I found him a while back on, uh, if you've ever heard of the website, Fiverr. And the idea is that they offer a special for five bucks to kind of introduce their work. So I found him on there as a color flatter. And he does colors, too. And he became my color flatter on Bear Mageddon. Bear Mageddon took a hiatus. It's actually on hiatus right now, because I'm actually doing a lot better. But my neck, I had this uh, very painful disc in my neck. Basically forced me to work from bed. And I was working on Appalachian Apocalypse, and I was really in no position to even be drawing for months there. But I I laid in bed and drew a lot of Appalachian Apocalypse on a Windows surface because I just couldn't sit at my desk at my Wacom. Because it was kind of laborious, I had to put Bear Mageddon on hold because I just couldn't do both at the same time. So Ben hadn't been getting many Bear Mageddon pages from me. And uh, when they asked if I knew any colorists, I suggested him. He's very dependable colorist. He's always, you know, he turns things around quickly. And he did some great work on this book, too. So that's something people want to ask their comic shops about. Coming out through Cave Pictures. It's a new comic book company. So mm -hmm. uh, something you definitely want to check out. But now I have a segment of the show called Kicking Back with the Creator where I ask you questions about you to get to know you better as a person. So it's not comic-related stuff unless you want it to be. Okay. Uh, and I'm going to do this a little differently. Normally, I like to have both creators on the show at the same time, but that just wasn't possible. Time zones, commitments, everything. So I'm going to kind of do it like the newlywed game. Have you heard of that? Uh, heard of it. Old show. I want to. I don't know the rules. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, Bob Eubanks was the host, and he'd have couples on, and he'd ask them, he'd have just the guy, and then he'd have just the woman. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then yeah. he'd say, what would this person say? So right. I want to get your answers to these questions. If you have any idea or what you think it may be, tell me what you think Billy's answer would be. And then I'll tell him what you said. It could be interesting. I don't know. I, mean, I, don't know. I pretty much just worked with the guy in this comic, so I'm really shooting in the dark. Yeah, but it'll be fun to hear what you think it might be. Okay. The most important thing is your answer. So talked a bit about how you have a chance to decompress at the end of a long day. What do you like to do for rest and relaxation? I'm a big cigar smoker, though I, I do tend to smoke cigars while I work. Usually around in the afternoon, one o'clock or two o'clock, I start to get tired of sitting at a desk because I, I basically rent a cubicle at an office building and there's like a real estate guy across from me and a eviction paralegal guy on their side of me and uh, it's very like corporate <laughs> so i start to at a certain point want a different uh, environment and i also do writing for work too so i do a lot of random stuff application of apocalypse is one of the indie or the independent gigs i was doing so i take off to my cigar shop in upland because i live out in ranch cucamonga usually spend a couple hours at the end of the day there working on writing work or graphic design work that i've got and i smoke a cigar too so i really enjoy cigars i smoke pipe and i also really like to play a banjo and the guitar i'm no longer in a rock band but i I just sit there and play either the acoustic guitar. Or I got a banjo a couple of years ago for Christmas, and I've gotten pretty good at it. I'm not, no virtuoso, but I can do it. I can pick. Do you have any idea what Billy would say about what he does to kick back? That's so wide open, I know. I'm guessing that he drives around in World War II era vehicles and shoots guns into the air. And, well, I guess no. He paints images of hot women for work, so I guess he wouldn't do that for, I don't know. <laughs> And that's a tough he shoots one. <laughs> shoots old guns uh, and waves American flags around and like drinks moonshine. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. How to do? I think you might be close there. I think it might be hitting on something. But I have a few more that you probably will have a good answer for. And I mean that's not that's a very creative answer. I'll give you that. And it's not too far <laughs> off base. I think now, this one's tough. I think to guess what would be for him. But for you, you can tell me. Thinking back. To any birthday, which one was your favorite birthday or which one stands out in your mind the most? doesn't have to be a great birthday, but one that just stands out. I think uh, I can't remember what age I turned, but this is a couple years into my marriage and my wife threw me a surprise party. I'd never had a surprise party before. And it was so insanely thoughtful and, and awesome because like we showed up at a friend's house from church and thinking I was just going to have lunch with them. And then we go walk in and my family from Oregon is there and there's all these people there. My brothers are there. My mom's there. There's all these neighbors there that I didn't even know would ever come to my birthday party. And But the thing that happened, 
I was in this intense work mode and then without knowing it, suddenly my family was in town and they had they were staying for five days. Something in my personality, like we discovered that <laughs> I guess I don't like surprises as much as the next person, but I tried so hard to not show that I was like stressed out by that. I didn't hide it well. I guess my wife vowed to never throw me a surprise party again. <laughs> so I guess, <laughs> I don't know. It was nice, but the, and there was something about the sudden family visit without any warning that uh, even though I, I love my family, I don't know what it was. Something about just being uprooted from my plans, I guess. I used to tell people, I don't tell them anymore, but I used to tell them, you know, for a bachelor party, if you have something in mind like we're going to kidnap you, don't. Don't. Yeah. <laughs> don't. I mean, I will fight back. Don't do that. <laughs> That's yeah, a like, surprise. I, like I do not like thing. No, 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 no. I don't like that. Now, it would be tough, I think, to say what was Billy's favorite birthday and why. So if you want to just pick an age, a number, Maybe he'll have a story about it. I don't know. That is a tough one because it's wide open. 21. <laughs> okay, he'll have a story. He's got to have one for that one. We all do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, has he not answered you yet on any of these? No, he hasn't. Oh. Thinking back to middle school, in your bedroom, what posters and or pictures did you have on the wall, if any? I lived in my garage. We had insulated it, except for we still had the garage door that would slide open and close. I was very much a Nirvana teenager, tried to look like Kurt Cobain. I had Nirvana posters covering my garage door. And my entire room was covered, and it's a garage, so it was a big room, but it was covered in stuff. Artwork, magazine clippings, bizarre images that I found. I just surrounded myself in bizarre images, things I had drawn. I liked drawing rats with cyborg body parts and giant battery packs on them and laser eyes. I don't know. This is something <laughs> I was obsessed with. Just whatever. I had weird creatures hanging that I had built. You know, so it was a very, I had like this giant rat mask that I had made that I had above my door. I had a very bizarre, scary garage bedroom, but a lot of uh, 90s alternative bands. <laughs> I was really, we had a, there's a drum set right in the middle of my room and amps and you know, it was basically a, a jam spot for me and my friends. We lived out in a tiny town where the main intersection was a four-way stop sign with a blinking red light on it and that was the main hub of the town. It was called Lakeside. I think the population is around 800 maybe, which seems generous, but it's a tiny town out in Oregon in rural Oregon, and that's where I lived in high school. Now, I get the band posters. I get the Nirvana stuff and your own art. What's the fascination with the rats? I loved rats. I also had tons of pets in my room. I had this giant cage that I had partitioned off and put cages on top of. It was basically a giant workbench that was in the garage, and we put a bunch of chicken wire around the bottom part of it, so the bottom shelf acted as a floor of a cage, and then we added more cages on top. And I basically had a mini miniature zoo in there. I had rats, I had Egyptian spider mice, I had a tortoise, I had chinchillas, I had mice, I had hamsters, whatever I could get. So I, I don't know, I was obsessed. My rats were always my favorite. I had this one rat named Simon who was a really good pet. I basically let him run free in my room. And he'd come when I called him. He'd, if I called his name, he'd come out of my giant messy room and run up my leg up to my shoulder and just sit up there. And he was very, uh, he was an amazing pet. Like, he was really like a dog but uh i bought him and one other rat the other rat came home and turned out to be pregnant gave birth to a bunch of other rats so i had all these rats i didn't like and then i had simon and simon was the one rat who got a giant tumor and died early so that was sad but I, I, yeah that's my love for simon <laughs> we have something in common and i think the statutes of limitation are far enough along now that i don't have to worry about this but <laughs> i had lab rats as pets actually i never lost a subject Oh, wow. I mean, these were not, like, experimented on with chemicals or anything like that. So they weren't, like, these wild mutant rats that I was letting out into the wild. You know, it was just, mm -hmm. you know, it was just like uh, I was using, like, artificial sweeteners, check their brain waves and behavior. And the rats loved oh. it. They loved the, the sweetener. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, I got the sweetener all day. One of them, too, had a problem with it. It got this infection, an inner ear infection, so his head was tilted. Like, his, his hmm. balance was thrown off. You have to exclude it from the study. And I'm like, well... I said to my professor, I said, can I try to treat it? And he says, yeah, we can give it some antibiotics and see what happens. And he straightened out. He right. got better. And we named him Mookie <laughs> after the ball player Mookie Wilson because they were in the World Series at the time. And he stayed in my dorm room. Well, it was an apartment. <laughs> <laughs> and we loved it, you know. Cool. It was cool. And then the rest of the subjects, I brought them home. And I found places for them. But the tail freaks people out. It's not a big deal. They're perfectly harmless they're, they're kind of cute yeah i never understood the fear of them i always thought they were great pets. if you know how to pick them up grab underneath the armpits and cross their arms that way they can't bite your finger 
hmm. when you're teaching them how to be handled. Because at first, like, get off me, but then they're like, oh, hi. But you have to kind of pick up a certain way to keep yourself from getting nipped at. <laughs> yeah, I never had a rat that bit me, but I also was always, I was never a big picker upper. I liked to train them that getting on me meant getting treats. So, uh -huh. but a lot of them were too scared to try. But Simon was like off the bat, he was just ready. I'd put my hand out and he'd run up my arm. And again, I just want to say that no rats were harmed. They lived a full <laughs> life and were very happy. So and I, one was I do, healed. Yes, and one was healed. And I do like pets and animals. I'm not the kind of person that could do anything. Some people, no problem going to the lab. And I've seen some, they do things that are part of the curriculum. And I'm like, I can't go there. I can't do that. You know, mm. I, the, the section stuff is like, oh, can't do it. But anyway, I digress. <laughs> it's too late. You're going to be doxxed now. And your house is going to be covered in pig blood. And <laughs> when you get home. <laughs> <laughs> now, what do you think Billy might have had in his room growing up? All I know about him is that he's obsessed with, like, military stuff, so I don't know if he still is. I imagine him being into, like, Leonard Skinner and, like, bands like that. <laughs> so maybe, maybe there's, like, Southern rock bands or something. I don't know. <laughs> Guns and Roses. I don't know. A hypothetical. If you were stuck on a deserted island and you can only have one book with you, and this is a book for pleasure, mm -hmm. uh, what would that one book be that you'd like to have to read? Oh, well, I always feel like it's a cop-out answer on this, but... You know, I hate to call myself a good Christian. Even I even use the word devoted, but it is a big part of my life. So I would probably take the Bible. If the Bible was like a given and it was like an island that was like Gideon's had a Bible already there, like there's a nightstand on the island and there's already a book in there, <laughs> then I would bring Orthodoxy by G.K. Chesterton, which sounds like a really stuffy book, but it's actually very whimsical and it's one of my favorite books. Just It's a book about his faith and why he believes and uh, it's a very unique take. And I'm a huge fan of that. G.K. Chesterton is my favorite author. He's mostly known for quotes. His quotes are the, people like Catholics like him. I'm not a Catholic, but uh, he's really known. His quotes are very popular. Like he has a, if you've ever read Coraline by Neil Gaiman, Neil Gaiman quotes him at the beginning of Coraline to start the book off. That quote is now all over the Internet attributed to Neil Gaiman. But it's actually Neil Gaiman quoting G.K. Chesterton. Thanks for putting that in context now. Huh. <laughs> Now, what do you think Billy would want to take? I don't know. It could be the Bible, too. Yeah. I think faith is an important thing to him. Yeah. Yeah, I know he's a faith guy, too. It's not the Bible. It's probably like uh, the collected military illustrated centerfold issue. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> like a giant tank fold out in the middle of the magazine. <laughs> He's really into military stuff. I, his script had all these details about military stuff. And then, like, I was like, when when it, the notes would always come back, it would be about, like, well, they don't really wear that exact uniform or whatever. And, uh. <laughs> Another hypothetical in terms of an action figure, if someone were to make an action figure of you, what would you want to be your accessory? I guess at the moment, maybe my banjo. I love my banjo. And for Billy... Probably something, a weapon, it could be a sword or something military related for sure. What do you think? I'm guessing it'd be some kind of Civil War weapon, like a, some kind of Civil War rifle or he's really into Civil War stuff. As far as I know, I could be wrong, but he's into military history in general, so who knows? And your beverage of choice would be when you're resting and relaxing? Uh, it would be a beer that is in the category of being a stout or a porter. I like them both. I like a lot of different kinds. I'll be honest with you. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, there's like, so many kinds. Yeah, I, I don't know. really have a favorite. There's so many to try. I mean, I like IPAs, especially in the colder months here on the East Coast. I like a nice porter, something a little darker, you know, a little heavier. Mm -hmm. For Billy, maybe it's moonshine. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Could be moonshine. Could be. I don't know why I just see him being like a straight up bud drinker or something. He just likes his beer simple. None of that fancy stuff. The last two questions, I won't make you figure out what Billy would answer. It's tough. You know, it's just too wide open. So for you, what is the oddest job that you've ever had? I mean, outside of comics. It was like dishwasher, pizza delivery boy. I was a trap boy one time at a gun range. You sit in this little tiny hole in the hill a little cave, a little concrete cave, and there's like a robotic arm in there that slings clay pigeons into the air. And then guys up on the hill, they shoot the clay pigeons. And you just, for some reason, I don't know why this isn't automated. And maybe it is now, but back then, I had to just sit there in that little hole all day and just open up boxes of clay pigeons and load them onto that arm and then get out of the way before that thing flung out and like <laughs> took my head off. 
So you and couldn't it, really daydream. <laughs> yeah, and these were in my uh, in my Kurt Cobain grunge days. So I had my hair was all long, and I hated rednecks. And like, but I lived in this total redneck area. I stood like a complete sore thumb because it was like this is like an odd job, but it was just over a weekend. You know, there are all these rednecks in their camo, and then there's just me and my like tie dye and ripped up jeans and long hair, and they kept talking about how they were gonna scalp me or rip my hair out, or they were joking around, messing with serious, you, yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> But I was scared <laughs> to death of these people, and I was, but yeah, it was weird. I was, I was sitting there. The, the weirdest experience from that was that I, in spite, I would like knock the middle out of the the clay pigeon so that it was like hollow and it was just like a rim, which made I assume made it harder to hit. So I just crack it on my knee. And the other thing I did once, I drew a smiley face on one, <laughs> and it shot off into the air. And I didn't even know this, but at the end of the whole weekend, we had to go out there. And people are just shooting these things all day long, hundreds and thousands of them. We had to go out there and find any that had landed and not broken. And reuse them? And reuse them, yeah, recycle them. And I happened to find my one smiley face one. He survived. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yeah, I can believe it. <laughs> now, my last question, what is the best film ever made, in your opinion, and why? Because you studied a lot of films for structure and to help with your own storytelling structure. But films that you just like to watch without doing too much analysis, what's the best one? I don't know. I, I hate using the word best or anything. I also feel like I'm, I don't feel like I'm a good authority, but I do have... Your favorite. My general go-to is Iron Giant. I just have a... That, oh, that movie great. has a very special place in my heart. I'd also say I really like uh, Secondhand Lions, which both of those are written by the same guy. So I guess I really like him. and I can't remember his name, but... I just thought it was interesting that the same writer on both of those. But I think those are both awesome movies. I did see Iron Giant. That is a really, really good film. And I did see Shaun of the Dead, and I enjoyed that. <laughs> those would be up there. The Edgar Wright films, especially what they call the Cornetto trilogy. Uh, Shaun of the Dead, Hot Fuzz, and uh, World's End at World's End. I love all three of those so much. Maybe Billers would be something like Apocalypse Now or Patton. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, something like that. <laughs> Ethan, thank you so much for joining me today to be on Creator Talks and talking about your work and Appalachian Apocalypse. Thanks for having me. Next week, my guest will be Billy Tucci. We are going to talk about his Sergeant Rock comic, The Lost Battalion, his work with Ethan Nicole on Appalachian Apocalypse, and a Kickstarter he has going right now called Zombie Summer. And that is one of just three zombie stories he's doing this year. And of course, we will discuss Billy's creator-owned character, She, which is over 25 years old now, and Billy has something in store for her in the months ahead, and we'll talk about that. And with the Kicking Back with the Creator segment, we find out what Billy's answers are and how close Ethan was to guessing them correctly. Now, as listeners know, I post comics from my collection, Saturday Silver Age and Sunday Bronze Age, on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, at Creator Talks Pod. And I thought about that, and I realized that a lot of the books that I'm posting are creators that I'll never get the chance to speak with because they're no longer with us. So sharing those books with you takes on more of an importance to me now, picking out the books that really meant a lot to me and still do today, and pointing out to you some of the interesting panels that are in the book, advertisements, and other things about the books themselves, such as date stamps. I love finding books with date stamps from the stores where the books were sold. Those to me aren't flaws. They're a bonus. It shows me some of the history of the book when it actually went on sale versus the cover date. I really like it when the stamp includes the name of the store or drugstore where the book was sold. Because just like newsstands that have vanished, so have books being sold through drugstores. So that tells me a little more about the history of comics and how they were distributed back in the early days. The other thing I'm doing too is diversifying the books that I'm sharing with you. I grew up as a Marvel zombie. I didn't read very much DC. Those were usually given to me by my parents. But what's great about that is I have this whole segment of comic books that I've never read before and I can enjoy them for the first time and I can pick the very best over the past several decades. Most notably, DC Comics like Superman, Batman, The Atom, The Flash. So if you have any suggestions about great comics from the DC Silver Age or Bronze Age you want to send my way, you can share your suggestions on social media at Creator Talks Pod or you can email me directly contact at creatortalks.com. That's contact at creatortalks.com. This show is available on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, YouTube, and Amazon Alexa-enabled devices. And if you have not yet, you've been putting it off, please rate and review the show on iTunes. It goes a long way to helping the show. And talk it up amongst your friends who also like comic books and also like the creators behind the comics and want to know more about them. 
And hey, if there's other podcasts that you like, please rate and review them. There's a lot of great ones out there, and you should also tell your friends about them. You know, in a way, we live in the golden age of podcasting because we can pick just about any subject that means something to us and find a show that matches our tastes. It is the free version of satellite radio. You can listen to your favorite topics any time of day or night on demand for free. Once again, I'd like to thank my sponsor, The Comic Book Shop at 1855 Marsh Road at the Plaza 3 Shopping Center in Wilmington, Delaware, zip code 19810. It's a great store. It's where I go. Members who have a pull box can get 25% off any of the back issues in stock that are in the bins, and K-issue case books and variant covers are 10% off. We know they had a graphic novel swap just last week, and I dropped off 10 of my gently used graphic novels, many of which I already have in digital format, and picked up 10 other ones that I haven't read yet. So that's a wonderful perk for subscribers. Plus, they have their monthly book clubs. Please check out their website, thecomicbookshop.com, to find out which book clubs are available and which may interest you. Well, as I always say, thank you for joining me for this week's Creator Talks. I know you have a lot to choose from. you got your television, streaming, etc., etc. It's tough to choose, but you've chosen wisely. And come back next week for Billy Tucci and the other interviews I have in the works. For Creator Talks, this is Christopher Calloway. Until next time.